What is up, my friends? My name is Kim, and if you are interested in true crime like I am, I hope that you consider hitting that subscribe button. I post two times a week, and you don't want to miss a thing. I hope you are having a fabulous day today. Today's case is about Centoya Brown. At age 16, she should have been going to driver's training, but instead, she was in court being sentenced to life in prison. Centoya, on August 6, 2004, committed a crime on a man who had hired her for intercourse. She claimed self-defense, but his positioning shows another story. Is she too young to spend the rest of her life in prison? Can children be reformed? These are the questions I hope will be thought-provoking as you know more about this case. Let's talk about it now. I discovered this case from a Netflix documentary. It's called the Centoya Brown story or something along those lines. Centoya's actions were very serious and caused a man at the age of 43 his life. His name was Johnny Allen. Johnny Allen picked Centoya up and negotiated a price of $150. But first, let's go back a bit to understand how, how a 16-year-old ended up selling herself at such a young age. Centoya was born in Tennessee to a mother who was a heavy drinker and eventually became addicted to other stronger substances. Her mother was only 16 years old when she had Centoya. While her mother was pregnant, she continued to drink. So there is some evidence that Centoya could have suffered from fetal alcohol syndrome. After giving birth to Centoya, she realized that she could not care for her. Centoya bounced around from many homes before she was adopted at the age of two years old. Centoya was adopted by a school teacher by the name of Elinette Brown. She lived in what was described as a loving home, but Centoya would start getting into trouble at a very young age. Centoya is a complex child. She is the little girl that everyone would love to have. This is a kid um, who had some horrible life experiences. Centoya began to have encounters with the juvenile court system. She spent time with the state's Department of Child Services between April 1st and September of 2003 after committing crimes against a person and crimes against property. Centoya spent two years in DCF facilities, including a year at Woodland Hills Youth Center in Nashville. She ran away from these facilities several times eventually ending up as a runaway on the streets of Nashville in August of 2004. While a runaway, Centoya met Garrison McGlothan, also known by the street name Cutthroat, often abbreviated to Cut. He was a 24-year-old. He began trafficking, basically, 16-year-old Centoya. What is a 24-year-old doing with a 16-year-old? He would tell her she needed to pull her weight and get out there and make some money. During this time, she and Cut lived in a hotel called In Town Suites Hotel. Centoya supported Cut and her. <laughs> Centoya supported her boyfriend Cut and herself via involuntary street worker as a victim of domestic minor trafficking. Cut threatened beat her on many occasions. On the night of August 6, 2004, 16-year-old Centoya met 43-year-old Johnny Allen in the parking lot of a Sonic Drive-In in Nashville, Tennessee. Michael was a real estate agent. He also was a youth pastor as well as a Sunday school teacher and started a homeless ministry at a local Baptist church. Allegedly, Johnny asked her if she was hungry and if she was 
up for some action. The detective asserted that Centoya answered yes to both questions and accepted Johnny's offer to take her to his house. She was a bit nervous about going to his house and she had never done this before. They, She's always went to hotel rooms, but she agreed. Centoya and Johnny ordered dinner at the Sonic drive through and Johnny drove the pair to his home. On the way to his home, he was bragging about him being a real estate agent, how he was in the military, basically building himself up, and it made Centoya feel small. Centoya testified that she agreed to have relations with Johnny for $150, but claimed that they never actually engaged in any intercourse. Johnny's friends and family denied any fact that this was Johnny's personality and that they denied that they even think that he even solicited Centoya for relations, instead claiming that he was trying to help her because he was a youth pasture. He wanted to help the homeless. That's who he was. However, the lead prosecutor in the case claimed that Johnny picked Centoya up to pay for relations, stating that was a fact from the start to finish. Another minor who was a waitress at a local restaurant claimed that she and the other young teens at the restaurant felt uncomfortable whenever they had to serve Johnny. One of the waitresses testified in court. She said that he would hit on the teens regularly. Whether that was them looking into it, maybe he was a flirt, maybe he was, maybe he wasn't. He's not here to tell his side of the story but that's just what's been being reported. According to Centoya, she left her hotel room around 7 p.m. because Cut told her, her boyfriend Cut, told her she is slipping and needs to get on her grind. So she walks to the Sonic restaurant looking for a ride. Um, I was in the hotel room. And what were you doing with Cut in the motel room at the in-town suites? We are either getting high or having sex. That's all we ever did. He said that I was slipping and that I was starting to become a slouch, that I needed to get out and get on my grind and get some money. When I left, I was looking for a ride so I can go out to East Nashville. Who were you going to see in East Nashville? Well, I wasn't going to see particularly anyone. I was going to an area that I knew was very, I don't know, it's a lot of people go there and prostitute. Okay. Um, and how were you going to get there? I was going to get a ride from someone. When you walked up to the Sonic, who approached you? A man in a white truck. And is this the person that has been referred to throughout this hearing, Mr. Allen? Yes. Um, the question came up, was I up for any action? And the action, I guess you should know that it was insinuating sexual. He asked me how much, and I told him 200 and he said, no, 100, and we decided finally on 150. Who made the suggestion of going to his house? He did. I had actually suggested the hotel we was right there at, but he didn't want to go to the hotel. He said that he wanted to go to his house because there was no one there. Did he tell you who he lived with or anything like that? He said he lived by himself. That time he was just finished telling me about his accomplishments and saying how that he used to be in the Army and because I mentioned that I was from Fort Campbell, and so he related to how he was frosty in the army before and that he was a sharpshooter in the army. So, so she could make some money. Then Johnny pulls up and asks her if she needs a ride. She said yes, and she jumped in the car. He asked her if she was up for some action, and she says yes. He asked how much. She said 200. He said 100, and then they settled in the middle at $150. They got some food, headed to his house. Once in the house, she notices two guns immediately. And then while she's sitting at the kitchen table, Johnny shows her another gun while she was eating her food. This made her feel very nervous and anxious. You know, she's never really been to one of her gentlemen 
house before and so this was all new to her so she's just feeling a little uneasy so she asked to go to the living room to watch tv he agrees he says yes she said she wanted to go to the living room where the tv was so she could be closer to the front door she goes on to say that she then asked if they could go to sleep for a little while that she was really tired and he agreed they went up to the bedroom she says that he was talking about how important he was and that she was a nobody and no one knows where she's at. So she was hoping he would fall asleep and she could just sneak out. He started to grab her and was rubbing her while they were in bed and she acted like she was sleeping and she says he gave her a look, an angry look. You tend to be a nervous person. Yeah. Was there anything that made you especially nervous that night? Um, just how he was acting, just how he talked. It's like the way he talked, how he was just so important and stuff. And then me, I look at myself, who am I? Who am I to him? It's like, then he talks about the guns and stuff. If he does something to me, I'm sitting here thinking, what can I do? I'm in his house. Ain't nobody going to know where I'm at. My mom and them, they don't know where I'm at. The people that I stay with chick on them, they don't know where I'm at. Nobody's going to know what happens to me. Cut, he doesn't care. He doesn't even know who I left with. And all this is just running through my mind, and I'm just a nervous wreck. Mr. Allen was asleep and facing away from you when you shot him. No, sir. All right, I, what I want you to do is to explain to the court how you have, you have a gun in your purse on the night, correct? Right. You don't want to do this. You don't want to be here. So you felt like if you tried to leave, he would harm you. Right. And your your belief in that is based on the fact that he told you he had some guns and he's a sharpshooter. Not only that, but uh, the way also, he was acting. Well, all I know about his activities is what you've told us, and that's really all we'll ever know, Miss Brown. Right. Since you killed him, the uh, the only thing we know is that you he took you to Sonic. He bought you food. He took you home. You used his bathroom, you felt comfortable doing that. You ate with him, you felt comfortable doing that. You sat on the couch and watched TV with him, you felt comfortable doing that. You got in the bed and at least one time went to sleep while he was there. You felt comfortable doing that. I never went to sleep. What, what happened next? At first he was just stroking me, but then it's like he just grabbed me like in between my legs, like he just grabbed it real hard. And he just gave me this look, it was like a very fierce look. And then it just sent these chills up my spine. I'm thinking he's gonna hit me or do something like that. But then he rolls over and reaches, like he's reaching to the side of the bed or something. So I'm thinking, now oh, he's not gonna hit me. He's gonna get a gun. Mm -hmm. and, and what did you do at that time? I just grabbed the gun and I shot him. A look that she equated to him wanting to hurt her. And he rolls over and she at that moment thought he's reaching for a gun. So she got her own gun and took his life with one bullet in the back of the head. But what's interesting about this is what happens next. So what does she do after such a traumatic incident? Cry? Call 911? Oh no. She steals $172 from Johnny's wallet and two of his firearms and flees the scene by stealing his truck. Excuse me, self-defense. <laughs> Centoya left Johnny's truck at a Walmart parking lot and flagged down an SUV for a ride home. Police later found Centoya and Cut at the hotel, the in-town suites hotel. The lead detective in the case of Johnny's wrote that on August 7th, Centoya had a neighbor drive her back to that Walmart where she had left his truck claiming that Centoya asked the neighbor to drive her back to Allen's house so that she could steal more items, but he refused. The neighbor of Centoya reportedly told the detective that Centoya told him that she committed the crime for $50,000. That's a fish story if I've ever heard one and some guns. The detective further asserted that Centoya told the neighbor that the crime was a fat lick, aka robbery, and that she had been waiting on a lick like this all week. 
According to the detective as well, after the neighbor told his roommate about the incident, Centoya called him on the phone and threatened him saying, you better stop running your mouth about my business or I'll get you too. So as you can probably tell, Centoya was not that sweet angel as she looks in her cute pigtails in court. If the story of Centoya Brown was going to stop here, I would say lock her up, throw away the key, no questions. It sounds like she would definitely do it again and has little to no remorse. But let's continue and get more facts because this story does not end here. Centoya was arrested and charged with homicide, aggravated robbery, handgun possession, and criminal impersonation. Despite only being 16 at the time, she was tried as an adult. She was right on that border, 16 and older. And so she was tried as an adult. The decision came from the Metro Juvenile Court Judge Betty Adams Green on November 14, 2004, who argued that it was too much of a risk to the community to keep this 16-year-old in a juvenile court system. Centoya never denied shooting Johnny. Rather, she argued the fact that she committed it in self-defense. Centoya stated that Johnny had intimidated her by repeatedly standing over her and touching her while she laid in bed and that she believed Johnny was reaching for a firearm as the two laid in bed. This led her to shoot Johnny with her own firearm, which she had gotten from cut for protection. Prosecutors took the stance that Centoya had not been in danger and that she had committed the crime to Johnny as he slept naked in bed in order to rob him. Police noted that there was no gun found under or around the bed. Based on the position in which his body was discovered, investigators believed that Johnny was asleep. Forensic noted that the post-mortem Johnny was laying with his hands underneath his head with his fingers interlocked. That type of wound to his head would have prevented him from moving. He would have been lifeless immediately. On August 14th, Centoya was taken to the Western Mental Health Institute for evaluation. According to the court documents, Centoya allegedly attacked and threatened a nurse at the Mental Health Institute after the nurse did not allow her to call her mom. The nurse claimed that Centoya jumped over her desk, grabbed her hair and face, and hit her, giving her several bruises and abrasions. During the attack, Centoya allegedly told the nurse, I shot that man in the back of his head one time, and I'm going to shoot you three times. The nurse, along with another institute employee who witnessed the incident, testified at Centoya's trial. Three jail inmates hoping to receive leniency in their own pending criminal cases claimed Centoya spoke to them about the crime and confessed to what had happened to Johnny just to see how it felt. What? These Dogs are going crazy. Another inmate gave the police a note that Centoya had allegedly given, which said, everything is the truth. I swear it on my life, except for I thought he was getting a gun and the feeling of nervousness. At trial, a forensic document examiner testified that, in his opinion, the note was written by Centoya. The cellmate whom Centoya had given the note to and spoken with also testified in her trial. Further evidence against Centoya came from a phone call between her and, it's reported as her adopted mom, but it's her mom. Uh, she adopted her. I don't know why reporting is done that way. It's always maybe to make it I don't know, a little weird. But anyways, between her and her mom, during the call, Centoya admitted she had done it. And there's no question, honestly, she's always said she's done it. Centoya was found guilty of first degree and aggravated robbery and sentenced to life in prison. She was 16 years old. Could you imagine 16 years old? She wouldn't be eligible for parole until she was 67 years old. 
like I said, Centoya never denied she had done it. And in my opinion, it was intentional in nature. She was surrounded by criminals and the idea that she is tougher than her peers. Centoya did the unspeakable. Her 16-year-old young brain, addicted to drugs, living with a man who would rather sell her than protect her, poverty and wanting recognition from her peers, she did this in cold blood, in my opinion. But what happens next is the miracle in this case. Centoya served her sentence at the Tennessee Prison for Women, a maximum detention security facility in Nashville, Tennessee. Under her original sentence, she would have been eligible for parole, like I said, at 67 years old. In prison, Centoya earned her GD with a score of 656 in March of 2005, an associate's degree in liberal arts with a 4.0 GPA in December of 2015 from Lipscomb University, and a Bachelor's of Professional Studies in Organizational Leadership with a 4.0 GPA in May of 2019 from the same university. She was recognized for being a model prisoner in testimony presented at her clemency hearing before the Tennessee Board of Parole. Centoya's former pimp boyfriend, Cut, died on March 30th, 2005 at the age of 24, having been shot by Quartz Hines. I don't wish that on anybody, but I'm not mad that he's no longer with us. But that's just my opinion. While still in prison, Centoya married musician and entrepreneur Jamie Long, CEO of JFAM Music Inc. and co-owner of Texas Healthcare Business, who performed under the name J. Long and was formerly associated with R&B group Pretty Ricky. Centoya is now referred to as Centoya Brown Long. I can't find a man out here and she found one locked up? Good lord. On November 21st, 2017, Centoya's case went viral following several high-profile celebrities on social media posts expressing outrage over her sentence. Celebrities that posted included Rihanna, Kim, Kardashian, T.I., Snoop Dogg, and LeBron James. In March of 2018, it was announced that the Tennessee Board of Parole would hold a hearing on Centoya's clemency petition, a move that only 2% of Tennessee clemency applicants see. 2%. That's a big deal. The public hearing was held on May 28, 2018 at the Tennessee Prison for Women. At the hearing, several witnesses that knew Centoya from prison testified on her behalf, including Lipscomb University facilitator, her former prosecutor, Preston Ship, prison employees, local victim rights advocates, and a local nonprofit leader who ran a mentoring group for at risk teens with Centoya. Johnny's friend testified against clemency. Charles Robinson, a Nashville police detective who served as the lead detective in Johnny's investigation, also testified against the clemency for Centoya. He told the board that he did not believe that there was any evidence to support the claim that Centoya had been trafficked since she was 12 years old. And that's what she was claiming, that she was being trafficked. She felt really uneasy. She didn't want to be where she was, so that's why she reacted the way she did. The parole board was divided, with two voting to grant Centoya clemency, with her having already served 15 years, two voted that Centoya's sentence should be reduced from 51 years to 25 years, and two voted to deny the clemency altogether. On December 6, 2018, the Tennessee Supreme Court answered a question of law in conjunction with Centoya's federal habeas corpus appeal, stating she would be eligible for parole after serving 51 years. In response to the Tennessee Supreme Court's ruling, a wave of support resurged and emerged. 
Tennessee Governor Bill Hanslem to grant Centoya clemency. Letters, phone calls flooded the governor's office and social media blew up once again with all the same people fighting for Centoya. Detective Charles Robinson wrote a seven page letter urging Governor Hanslem not to give Centoya clemency. He wrote that Centoya Brown did not commit this crime because self-defense as her advocates would like you to believe. Centoya Brown's motive for committing the crime to Johnny in his sleep was robbery. At the beginning of this investigation, I considered the possibility that Centoya Brown was justified in committing the crime on Johnny. At the conclusion of the investigation, my findings were that she was not justified and her only motive was robbery. On January 7, 2019, the governor commuted Centoya's sentence of life in prison to 15 years plus 10 years of supervised parole. Centoya was released from prison on August 7, 2019. Back with breaking news, Governor Bill Haslam grants an executive clemency for Centoya Brown. He is commuting her sentence of life imprisonment. She'll be released to parole supervision on August 7th after serving 15 years in prison. Brown was convicted in 2006 of first felony murder and aggravated robbery in the killing of Antioch realtor Johnny Allen. The governor said his decision came after careful consideration of what is a tragic and complex case and further stated that imposing a life sentence on a juvenile that would require her to serve at least 51 years before even being eligible for parole consideration is just too harsh. Friends and family of Johnny the victim did not approve of the governor's decision. Writing on the friends of Johnny Allen's Facebook page, our hearts are broken today as the governor has decided to grant Centoya clemency. The activist mob with their reputation of Centoya's lies and slander managed to prevail against justice. So you can kind of see both sides of the story. Yes, he was the victim, but there's so many other factors that went into what happened. So you have both sides of it. Since her release from prison, Centoya Brown Long has conducted numerous interviews sharing her insight and critique on the criminal justice system. She has been the featured keynote speaker for different groups across the country, sharing her testimony of surviving domestic minor trafficking and her experience with the criminal justice system. She has been commonly referred as an advocate and activist. The ACLU brought in Centoya Long to head their national campaign, urging governors to use their executive power of clemency to combat systemic injustice and racism. A memoir of Centoya's 15 years in prison titled Free Centoya, My Search for Redemption in the American Prison System was published by Atria Books on October 15, 2019. So if you're interested in that, I'll link it below. In addition to her own work speaking about her experiences, Centoya's life journey has been of interest to notable media giants. The Netflix documentary that I've been talking, that I got this case from, that was released on April 29th of 2020. I'll link that below. I don't know if it's on YouTube, but I'll try to link it so you can find it. But Centoya and her husband founded a nonprofit organization together upon her release as well. The Foundation for Justice, Freedom, and Mercy operates under the name of the JFAM or JFAM Foundation and is a 501 organization that aims to empower individuals who are at risk of exploitation or criminal justice system involvement. So just some like that's everything with the case but my final thoughts I really think she at the time was looking for this lick as she calls it and poor Johnny did lose his life out of this but she reformed herself with time and distance from other criminals she went on to do some great things with her life the chances of her committing again 
in my opinion, are slim. But let me know what you guys think. Also, I want, as I spoke about in the beginning, about a child at 16 years old getting 51 years. Now, there are some kids that I really, really think should and do deserve those types of sentences at such a young age I don't know well if you guys have made it to the end you guys are rock stars and I love you to death there are more true crime videos in my captured killers playlist if you're interested either way stay safe my loves and I'll see you in my next one thanks so much for watching